good morning, church. I'm so thrilled that you're here to worship with us. Let's stand. We're going to sing a new song. We're going to learn it together this morning. Let's sing it out. stopped you Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty too since when has impossible ever stopped you this is the sound of dry bones rattling this is the praise make a dead man walk again hope in the grave I'm coming out He's here to rattle things up, amen. Sing this out. Yeah, the word of the Lord. 
Welcome to those of you gathering online from here and abroad, and those of you in person. We are excited to be bound together by the unifying work of the Spirit this morning. Amen. Uh, well, my name is Zach Anderson. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, uh, I hope to do so later after worship. I'm proud to serve as one of the pastors here at Covenant. It's my pleasure to welcome you. If you are a guest with us this morning, if you're new, uh, a special thank you for spending your first Sunday of 2021 with us this morning. Woo! Uh, a <laughs> couple of invitations for you this morning. The first, uh, I'm very excited. If you remember all the way back in March 2020 BC, before COVID, uh, the first Sunday that we had to take a break from in-person worship, we were about to launch something that I was very excited about called Foundations. Well, guess what? It's back. Uh, January the 13th, we are going to start uh, meeting Wednesdays at 6 for our Foundations study. Now, let me tell you my prayer for Foundations. Uh, we've been talking about revive, revival coming in the year 2021 in this community. It's something we've been praying for all year. And this is, I believe, a part of what God has led us to for how he is going to revive us in the coming year. Uh, my prayer is that we will build a community of believers who know how to read God's word, who fall in love with God's word, uh, and fall in love with the great commission of bringing it out into the community around us, all because we love God himself. Um, and so... Uh, my invitation to you is if you feel a stirring in your heart as we sing about dry bones rattling, open the graves, I'm coming out, as we hear the word through Jason from Ezekiel 37 about revive, as we talk about the prayer for revival, uh, which is how revival starts. It starts with prayer because God is the only one who can revive. Uh, if you feel a stirring in your heart, I hope you'll come Check it out on January the 13th, uh, Wednesdays at 6, and, uh, and see what God does. I'm very excited. Last but not least, I want to invite you uh, to, well, a few weeks ago, we had Deck the Halls of Covenant. You see all these beautiful Christmas decorations that have been uh, all throughout our, our building this Advent season. Today is the day that you get to go home uh, grab a quick bite to eat and a sledgehammer and come back for wreck the halls of covenant. Except it's not that kind of wreck the halls. Don't bring a sledgehammer, but we do hope that you'll go home, grab a quick bite to eat, maybe a quick nap, and come back uh, at 2 o'clock today. We're going to take down the Christmas decorations all throughout our building and put them away in a highly organized fashion so that it will be very easy to bring them back out next year. Uh, any of you that are able to come and serve in that way this afternoon, you don't need to watch the Texans or the Cowboys. The seasons are over. Uh, you don't, I mean, Cowboys fans, you still have a chance, but you don't want to make the playoffs. You need a draft pick, right? So, okay. Pastor Jason says, Cowboys fans, you need to be here. I'll say, Texans fans, you need to be here uh, 2 o'clock. We hope that you can come and help us out in this way. Let's pray together as we continue in worship. Lord God, we do believe that your presence is here in this place. 
And we know and proclaim that an encounter with your presence is what changes us from the inside out. So we ask that this morning, through worship, through the preaching of your word, through the community of saints, by your Holy Spirit's power within us, that we would be changed. Thank you so much that you loved us first. And now we could say, we love you too, God. It's in Jesus' name that we're gathered and we're expectant. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship, um, I want to center our hearts on a reminder uh, that the word of the Lord is truth. In the song that we sang earlier, uh, there were so many lyrics based in scripture about miracles coming from scripture. And as we continue in a time of worship, I want us to hear the word of God that we're about to sing, a word and a blessing that was written over 1400 years before Christ even came to earth. And we're singing it today because his word is truth. It never expires. It's timeless. Hear this word, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. We enter into his presence with praise and thanksgiving. This is a place of freedom always to worship him.
generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he's with you he's with you in the morning and the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you give you all the glory. as we declare this.
agree that we will praise him. Jesus, that your name will forever be on our lips. The King above all kings, the Lord above all lords. Jesus, we bow in reverence to you this morning. You are worthy. Pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. You can have a seat. After I saw what Robin put together with that, I thought to myself, the sermon that goes after it better be good. Uh, at this time, I'm going to dismiss the kids and head back to Cuff Kids with Miss Patricia as they uh, start off the new year together. We here in this space are going to dig into God's word uh, using the prophet Ezekiel chapter 37. If you have your Bibles, I hope that you'll turn with me there. Uh, we are establishing that the, uh, the annual theme for covenant is going to be revive. Revive 2020-21. Uh, revive 20... Whoa, good Lord. Revive means that we're putting 2020 in the past and 2021 is here. And we are establishing that this is what God uh, is going to do in our midst. We're proclaiming it. We're praying over it. And we're looking forward to seeing what God's word has to say about it. Ezekiel 37 is the story of the Valley of the Dry Bones. Uh, and uh, verse 3 and verse 14 combine together for a question and an answer uh, that is uh, our, our annual theme. Can these bones live? Can they? Can these bones live? The Word of God says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. This is what we're about this year. And so we're going to dig into Ezekiel uh, together, chapter 37. Uh, let's hear together the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord said, says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and, will, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound of the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breathe from the four, uh, from the four winds, and breath uh, came into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and, and, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, 
will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God offered to us in its reading and in its hearing. So we give thanks, Lord God Almighty. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious God, what a gift it is to be able to come together in this space and time. I ask, oh God, that you would work here in this room in this time. And I ask, oh God, that you would open our eyes that we would see, open our ears that we would hear, open our minds that we come to know and understand, open our hearts that we would feel its power. Then I ask, oh God, that you would open our hands that we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So my wife Lauren and I, for some three or four years, were, uh, were a foster home. Uh, and we had uh, three kids that we fostered for an extended period of time. Uh, Samuel James is a product of that foster and now adopted our son. Uh, and, and that season was, was such a gift, uh, but there are also many challenges. I don't know how much you know about the foster care licensing system, but uh, it's pretty intense. They come into your home uh, multiple uh, times a month, uh, different groups, and they, they have to license your home. They, they make sure that you have the ladder uh, to get out the window. If there's a fire, you have fire extinguishers that are, are kept up to date and checked, and, and you have a, a fire plan posted for evacuation so that your kids can know how to get out of the house, and all of your medicine is locked in uh, a lock box, uh, and, and there's nothing out uh, and, and open. I mean, that plus much more, just like all of everyone else's houses. I mean, just exactly, right? We had none of that before the, the, the process. But, but we went through the process, uh, and, and there are so many like kind of highlights of, okay, uh, will I actually remember this? Uh, continue to be a theme. We're learning so much. Am I going to retain it all? Well, we, we had to be uh, first aid CPR certified. And uh, we went through that training a couple of times because you have to renew it over the course of, uh, of time and its expiration. And, and both times that we went through it, I, I got to admit, I don't think I remember much from it. Like if you, if you, if you have an issue, I'm not your guy. Uh, I will trust that the Lord is going to provide a doctor or a nurse practitioner in the room to be able to take care of you. But, but I, I, here are the things that I remember. Three things. You ready? Number one, whenever you assess that the situation requires uh, your training, you say, you call 911. Right? You have to point, eye contact, direct, and make sure they know. Everyone in the room knows. It's Kevin. Kevin is the one. No, you. Call 911, right? So every, that's number one. I remember that because it was quite awkward, and they make you practice it. You role play it over and over again. So there's my role play for the day. Uh, number two, I, I remember that whenever you start the CPR, there's something you're supposed to do with your fingers and locking them and somehow. So I've already failed. I will kill you if I do that wrong. Then... But I remember the, the beats, the rhythm. If you've been through it, you know, because they, they, it's a miracle of the Lord. It's staying alive, staying alive, uh, 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 staying alive. I mean, now, who can forget that? Like, now all of you are officially as CPR certified as I am. You could do it. This is it. Number three that I remember is the defibrillator scares the ever-loving Jesus out of me. It, it, it is, you know what a defibrillator is, right? It, it used to be the ER hospital thing, right? Where, where uh, like, the, the emergency room, they have a patient that goes in, beep, 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 beep. Oh, no, he's coded. Ah, give me the paddles. Pump it to 95 joules of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right? The nurse practitioner over there is dying right now. 
Uh, but but that, 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 it used to be the thing for the ER. And, and I've been there as a pastor. I've been in an emergency room when members of my church have received the, the paddles. And I, I know whenever I'm doing CPR certification training that that lady is teaching me to put like a sticky thing here and a sticky thing here and then step back and then push the button like that I am not qualified for that. That is an emergency room hospital thing, not me. But if you need it, I'll be there for you. Don't worry. My certification only expired four years ago. (laughs) Those defibrillators are now designed so that buildings pretty much anywhere are going to have them, and they can bring you back to life. I mean, even, even in those most dire circumstances where, where, where there is no more beep on the monitor and it is flat, they could shock you back to life. Ezekiel is a prophet of the Lord. And uh, this scripture opens up Chapter 37, saying the hand of the Lord was on him and revealed to him, brought him to a a specific circumstance to teach him a specific lesson that he would then declare to the people of God, to us. Generations later, we would have this message today. And so it's really important. Now, now, if you you want like like a real upper, like something that's going to give you a a lot of joy, Read Ezekiel chapter 1 through chapter 32. It is the most depressing uh, portion of literature that you'll ever read. Uh, Ezekiel uh, is is the prophet of God in the season uh, where they are conquered and exiled from their land into Babylon. So so we we read from prophetic literature that, that happens all Uh, in in the back end of that Babylonian exile, or uh, as they are returning, we hear of prophetic uh, works as they're reestablishing what it means to be the people of God. uh, Ezekiel is the prophet that that bridges that exile. And those first 32 chapters are dark. It, It declares all of the ways the people of God have turned their backs on God and walked away from God. All of their sins, their, their, their depravity, it's listed in explicit fashion, and their penalty, establishing that what they're going through is because of their sin and brokenness. But then, but then, when you get to chapter 33 and following, we have oracles of restoration. Ezekiel, the prophet, is is given a series of visions and oracles that God places him in or places in him so that he could declare that that darkness does not have the final say. So that he could declare affirmatively that even though they have experienced exile and despair, there is yet hope. Revival is on the horizon. And so that's why when we get to chapter 37, uh, we could feel uh, the weight of all that has come forward in the scene that that God places Ezekiel in. Now, I want you to to imagine this vision uh, maybe in in a way that that we can connect with more easily as Christians who are really familiar with Jesus' teaching in the Gospels. He teaches oftentimes in the Gospels through parables. Right? He tells a story, and that story gives a, a lesson, a truth that we can then uh, claim and, and grow from. All right? So I want you to think of this vision as a parable. Now, sometimes Jesus explains the parables, and sometimes he just leaves it hanging. Sometimes it's just like mic drop, walk away, and you got to figure it out. Sometimes he's like, hey, this is what it's about. You might remember the parable of the sower where, where uh, Jesus says that there's a sower that sows seed in all of these different kinds of ground and it reacts different ways. But then he goes back and explains what it means. This vision in Ezekiel is like that where there's a vision and there's an explanation. Verse 11 is the beginning of the explanation. But I want to start with the vision. 
The vision uh, it describes a scene uh, using three words that, uh, that, that very quickly break down for us uh, what it is we're to, to, to be assessing the situation as. Ezekiel is taken by the hand of the Lord and placed in a valley of dry bones. A valley of dry bones. So the first word valley, we, we need to, 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 to rest there and understand what this means. Now, now this is uh, the two Sundays after Christmas Eve, so we might be thinking in terms of John the Baptist that he was called to prepare the way for the Lord, that he's going to, uh, to raise valleys and bring mountains low so that the Lord's word can come on uh, a plain and flat ground. Uh, but, but I want us to step aside from that a second and think about biblical valleys and the scene that might be portrayed accurately for what Ezekiel uh, is seeing. There's one valley in particular over the course of Scripture that is the most commonly referred to valley. It's the Jezreel Valley. The Jezreel Valley uh, sits in a broad, vast, fertile land. And, and it's in between the Mediterranean and the Sea of Galilee. And, and there's a mountain ridge uh, on the south and the east side and the west side. And there's a, a, one hill in particular, one mountain in particular called Megiddo. And Megiddo is where uh, there's a pinch point. So if you're traveling from north to south as an international trader, you would have to go by Megiddo and uh, through the Jezreel Valley to head uh, in intercontinental travel. This valley, the Jezreel Valley, is lush and beautiful. If you sit up top in Megiddo today, you look down on the valley and there are crops Everywhere, And you could tell that this soil is so masterfully uh, uh, crafted by God to provide rich agriculture to the whole region around it. But as with many valleys in scripture, there is threat in the valley. This valley, the Jezreel Valley, has been the host of countless wars including a number of wars throughout Scripture. In, in fact, it, it extends even further than Scripture. In 1918, in the First World War, the Allies fought the Ottomans in the Jezreel Valley. There are so many wars fought in the Jezreel Valley that, that this is known as Armageddon. So when you hear Armageddon, Armageddon comes from two words, har, which means a mountain, Megiddon, which is the same word for Megiddo. And so this is the mountain of Megiddo, which overlooks the Jezreel Valley. So the final battle of Armageddon will take place in the Jezreel Valley. So I want you to envision this lush, vast land that is tortured with war at the end of a battle where bones are strewn all across this land. And, and, and they're, from, they're from folks from all sides. Generations of bones have been laid in the Jezreel Valley. And Armageddon is said to come there as well. And here you have Ezekiel taken by the hand of the Lord to a valley filled with dry bones. I want you to imagine that sort of a valley. That sort of a valley that hosts despair and destruction, vulnerability, and maybe even the shadow of darkness and death. Maybe this is the valley of which David spoke in Psalm 23. Of course, this passage of Scripture echoes for us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. But when you get to verse 4, in the NIV it says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. But in the King James, which might echo for most of us, even though I walk through the valley 
of the shadow of death. That's a dark place. That's the kind of place that the Lord revealed to Ezekiel. It's a valley filled with dry bones. I think it's fascinating that this word dry comes into play here. It's not just that it's a valley of death or a valley of destruction, but it's bones. And it's not just any bones, it's dry bones. And it's not just dry bones, it's in verse 2, on the floor of the valley there were many bones, bones that were very dry. This is, a, this is a valley that has hosted death, but the death is not just recent. It's not just new. It's a death that has taken place over the course of many years. Have you been on a hike before, and, and you've been in some Texas wilderness, and you've found uh, the, the, the prey of some, uh, some predator, some lion, or, or some coyote, and there you find the, the jawbone or the or the leg bone, and, and, and you could look at it, and you could tell, is this more fresh? If so, beware, be distant, be cautious, right? Or is it very dry? Is it cracked? Is it maybe a bit chalky? Is, it, is the bone itself beginning to deteriorate? If it is, then, then you know that, that this is a place that has that has known death and that death has set in, in a really substantial way. That that there's hopelessness associated with this very dry bone. The psalmist David writes uh, uh, about this dryness in, in another way, and I think Ezekiel, as he stood in that valley with the Lord, might have heard the words of David in his ears uh, as as he could relate to this dryness. Verse 1 of Psalm 63 says it this way, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. That, That yearning for God And yet it seeming as though God is so hard to find because of how dry the setting is. I want you to think about a time in your life when you were most thirsty. Maybe you're a little bit more thirsty right now than you were a moment ago. What is that moment when you were most dry, most thirsty? For me, it was this year, literally speaking, uh, whenever our family took a, a hike uh, to the Zebra Slot Canyon, in, which is just north of Bryce National uh, Park in Utah. So we are on this mad adventure, and every day our family is doing something like outdoor crazy. You know how Amazon Fire Stick has like the floating screen with all like the really amazing pictures of of like world uh, landmarks or scenes, and you look at those pictures and you're like, man, where is that? I want to go there. Or where is that? I want to go there. Well, we basically did all of those in the United States of America this summer. That was that was our trip, and we wanted to see all of them. One of those on that on that Amazon Prime Stick. Uh, is the Zebra Slot Canyon. So, of course, you Google it. What is that thing? I want to go there. And uh, you get some instructions, and it tells you all about it, right? It's just that easy. See, it tells you go north on this highway, and then you go east on this dirt road for about eight miles. Then you park just past the cattle guard on the right, and then you hike in about a mile. You see the Zebra Slot Canyon, and you hike out. That simple. Thus saith Google, right? And so, and so our family, you know, it's, it's July, uh, it's Utah, it's 103.5, but it's a dry heat, so don't worry. Uh, and and we, we have done, I have done my research, and my family just trusted that I did my research well. And uh, so 
I tell the family, family, for all of these other hikes where we have hiked vast number of miles, we have needed all this water. But today, today we don't need nearly as much water. So just pack what's most comfortable, the easiest. Maybe your camelback, but don't bring extra bottles. It would just be a waste of time and energy. So after hiking three and a half or four miles in the desert wilderness, arriving at the Zebra Slot Canyon, we see it. And it is magnificent. It was everything we hoped for and more. Uh, very few of us could actually see it, though, because it was so narrow. You had to, like, monkey climb the wall in order to get in it. We're in it. Great pictures. Memories made. Awesome. Come out. Sit underneath the only tree that we could find in the entire valley. And we're eating lunch, and I take an assessment of the water, as a good father would do. And I find my daughter's camelback. Nothing empty. Bone dry. I get uh, my son Sam's camelback. Empty. Bone dry. My dad, who's with us, he has exactly half of his water left. Because when you hike in, you only drink half so that you have the same amount for the way out. Man, that's a professional. Then, uh, then I look at all the water bottles that the kids that were with us brought. They're all empty. All that's left is half of my camelback and half of my dad's water. That's it. And there are eight of us. To hike at 103.5 degree heat on the way back out, three and a half to four miles. And so about mm, maybe quarter of a mile on the way back out, I can see that this is going to end with death and destruction. No, seriously, this is not going to be good. They're going to find us in the middle of the desert, uh, and it, all that's going to be left is bones because we're that dry. So I tell Aiden and the bigs, Addie and their friends, I say, hey, look, y'all go on, uh, you know, whatever, you'll live, right? Here are the keys of the car. I need y'all to go back. And then what I need you to do is, Aiden, I'm sorry, it's you. You're going to have to get the extra water, and you're going to bring it back to me, Lauren, and Sam, and my dad, my 70-year-old dad who's hiking with us. And, and you're going to bring this water. So we gave them my camel back. We gave them my dad's water. We had no water left, and we sent the kids back to the van. And Aiden got back, grabbed the extra water, ran back to us, and, uh, w- and we were still about two miles uh, back to, to us, and I thought that I had killed my wife Lauren and my seven year old Sam because they, I mean, we were stopping every 50 steps. We were, uh, we, we were trying to find shade wherever we could. I was like standing over them so that the shade could drop down on them. That was the most dry, thirsty situation I have ever been in in my life. What's that situation for you? The psalmist writes, I thirst for you, my God, like I'm in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Ezekiel is set in a valley of dry bones And the word of God says those bones are very dry. And God in verse 3 has a question for you and for me. Can these bones live? Is there any hope for these bones? This situation is as bleak and desperate as you can imagine. Is there hope? Ezekiel, I think wisely, and we could take a a cue from him, wisely he says, uh, you know, I don't know. I look at the situation, I I don't know. But, But with you, all things are possible, so you know. So God gives instructions. God says, hey, you're going you're gonna to be my voice. Whenever, whenever you speak, I'm speaking. 
tell these bones to hear my word. My word is going to just pour out over them and, 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 and say, come together. And these bones are going to start coming together. And that's where we get the bones rattling, right? So all the bones are like coming back together. And you imagine that people have been walking on these bones, kicking these bones, and these bones are all scattered all over the place. And now like they're all forming and shaking up and rattling and boom, now, now that they're together and, and they're getting uh, 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 ligaments and sinews and tissue and, and, and flesh and skin. And you have all of these, all these bodies laid there and, and 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 you hear that and that's exciting in and of itself that dry bones have now come back together and it seems like maybe there's a glimmer of hope but it is yet still incomplete something more has to happen for life to to happen and so god gets excited god god's like man hey do you see this do you see what's going on but there is still not life in them because there's not breath in them verse 9 did y'all, verse 10, did you hear how excited God got? Then God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breath from the four winds, breathe into these slain that they may live. We need the breath of God to come into us to take our hopeless, desperate, dark situations and make us come to life so that, so that we can walk with the Lord, so that we are no longer dry. But as, 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 as Jesus says, now I'm like a, a, an eternal spring of water flowing in you that you will never thirst again. This is the Spirit of God come into you and me. And that's what the explanation of this parable of this vision looks like in verse 11 and following. There's this beautiful clarity that comes in verse 11 that, that, that I don't want us to miss. It, it's this explanation from God. God then says to Ezekiel, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. And they say, the people of Israel say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. You know, before that moment, what we have is God's assessment of the situation and Ezekiel's assessment of the situation. But what we hear in the explanation is a clear self-awareness from the bones. The bones themselves are clear about where they are are in relationship to God. They declare that they're dry, their hope is gone, and they are cut off. What is it for us today, January 3rd, 2021, to take an honest assessment of where we are with the Lord? Are there any areas of your life that are dry today. In any way, do you find yourself walking in a valley? When you assess your relationships, your employment, your finances, your walk with the Lord, your prayer life, your worship life, your Bible study life. When you evaluate your life of service or generosity, in any way do you find that you are like bones disjointed and disconnected? If there is, God provides a vision of hope for you and for me. God says, I'm not, I'm not going to leave you there. You're not just going to be bones left to the annals of history on the valley floor to dry up. No, no. What God says is, I, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. If you have your Bibles, I want you to underline three things in verse 13 and 14. Then you, 
He says, he's saying this to you. God is saying this to you. If in any way you're dry, you're without hope, you're in a valley, you're, you, you feel like th- there's death or despair around you, here's what he says to you. Then you, my people, he's calling you his people. This is a word for his people. Then you, my people, will know I'm the Lord. I will open your graves. I'll bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you. The spirit of the living God is being put in you, and you will live. Can these bones live? Can these bones live? You, my people, will receive my spirit, and you will live. On January 3rd, 2021, I need that. And if you need that, there is hope in the Lord. It's found in his word. It's found in relationship with one another here in community. And so I give God praise for what he's going to do in you and us together this year. Let's pray. Gracious God, what... A tremendous gift it is to be able to gather together your people. I pray, oh God, that as as we enter into this year, we would do so with, with, with great hope, great expectation of what you are going to do in us and through us, what you are going to accomplish in our midst. I pray, oh God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in us so that we would live. Lord, let us not be filled with hopelessness or despair, but let us be filled with your spirit that brings life. Lord, revive us. Bring about a great revival in our midst, in our community, and in the world. We know it is possible. We pray that that you will accomplish it and that we will have a part in it. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. and sisters, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You formed us in your image and... and Sorry, I thought I had it memorized. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. Spoke to us through the prophets. You delivered us from captivity to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks to you, Father Almighty. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to you. He turned to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we together proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So we pray, O God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these, your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. By your Holy Spirit, through your Son, Jesus Christ, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, both now and forevermore. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, with the confidence we have as children of God, will you join together with me as we pray the prayer of Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we'll receive the sacrament of Holy Communion uh, by approaching uh, three different stations. The ushers will guide you to. If you come with your hands held open, you'll receive a a cup. Both the wafer and the juice are in the cup by tearing uh, two different tabs. If you would twist instead of pull, it'll make it easier to open. The kneelers are open for all who desire to meet with the Lord in prayer to do so. Uh, If you would like to receive gluten-free, if you would just uh, come to my station and I'll serve you there. This is not Covenant's table. This is not a United Methodist table. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. As such, each and every one of you, all of us, are welcome to come. All has been prepared. Would you come at this time? Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every 
breath that we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside.
Jesus, we will build our lives upon your love. Your love is so much better than anything. Lord, I praise you for the message this morning. We take moments to take inventory and, and be self-aware of where we're at and to praise you because we know that you want to breathe life into us. We are open to that, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. We pray all this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for your continued uh, generosity to the ministry we share in here at Covenant. If you would like to give today uh, to the ministry, there's an offering plate on the table in the back. You can also give at covenantconnects.live for the Church Center app. Uh, please remember that uh, following the benediction, the ushers will dismiss you by row, uh, and uh, I hope that you'll uh, find your way out to the, uh, to the front lawn to be able to share in some time of fellowship and connection, uh, which we so desperately need uh, in this season. I want to thank all of you who have joined us for worship online. We're so thankful that God has established a way for us to connect and worship together, even in the midst of, uh, of the challenges of this season. Uh, would you stand as we together receive this benediction? Lord, we go forth from this place, your spirit in us, alive by the power of God in us. So we go into the world to declare your name to all we encounter, to celebrate that you have brought us back to life. Lord, use us as instruments of revival in our community and the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.